The book of Jude was written by Jude, the brother of Jesus, sometime between 60 and 80 AD. He writes to a church which had been struggling against false teachers that were living opposed to the teachings of Jesus and leading Christians astray in the process. Jude responds to these reports with an urgent message to defend the faith from corruption and selfish living. Jude reminds the church of God's righteous justice that had been delivered throughout history to the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, to rebellious angels, to the murderer Cain, and the sorcerer Balaam. In each case, these figures claimed authority independent from God and distanced themselves from His will. In return, God gave them over to their sinful desires, honoring their choice to live apart from Him. Jude says that these false teachers will meet the same fate if they continue to let their sinful urges drive their actions. The church must be different. Jude calls Christ followers to build each other up in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, keeping themselves secure in what they know and have experienced in God's love. Jude encourages the church to show mercy to those wavering in sin while remaining cautious not to be caught up in sin themselves. God is gracious and does not allow his people to fall too far from himself. In this brief letter, Jude shows how destructive it is to live a life apart from God. The selfish life is a dangerous life that produces only bad fruit. But new life in Jesus means we have been forgiven, set free from our old ways and desires to live righteously under the care and continued mercy of God. Good morning. So good to see everyone here and you online. Uh, So thankful that you're joining us on Facebook and also YouTube. So this weekend is Thanksgiving weekend, right? And it's a weekend where we are reminded and encouraged to give thanks. It's different this year, isn't it? It's different in the middle of a pandemic. It's different in the middle of the type of year that we had to give thanks. I found myself throughout the the weekend giving thanks for you know our family, our, our a group of four that ate together. Uh, but at the same time, going like, oh man, I wish I could be with you know the group of twenty or so that we would normally have. And I'm sure that you probably this weekend experienced something like that, uh, that you found yourself giving thanks, but at the same time saying, but yeah, I want to complain about this. And so uh, what I want to do is we start here, whether you're at home or whether you're here, is that you would take a moment and you would share with someone nearby you something you're grateful for. And the kiddos here in the front, you guys can share what you're grateful for too, is that um, what is it that you're grateful for? If you're at home, You can share with someone if you're at home or you can put it in the chat, whatever it may be. So take a moment. What are you grateful for? Share with someone. Gratitude is a great perspective changer. And as I look over here, I see the souls. I'm sure they were grateful to be together. Uh, and uh, Matt, Andrea, good to see you both. Uh, Matt, thanks for your service and uh, glad to see you back here. Um, I'm sure that was uh, much gratitude this week. And, and the same with, with all of you is that there's, there is many things to be grateful for. And, and it has great health impact. And so I'm grateful that you are here this morning in person or you're here online with us. It's just good to be together. So we're going to look at the book of Jude, and we're going to read the first two verses to start off with, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper here. So Jude, the first verse in the only chapter of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. We'll take that. I'll take mercy and peace and love in abundance. I'm sure you will too. That's something to be thankful for in this time. Now, when I looked at the book of Jude, there was one verse that going into Jude, I thought maybe I would speak on this one verse. And that was verse 23, which says, save others by snatching them from the fire. And I'm like, oh, this is a verse that often gets used in Jude and it's a highlight verse. 
So what I'll do is I'll talk about evangelism, I'll talk about salvation, and then we'll talk about how grateful we are for having Jesus, and that'll be the message. And then I read verse three. Verse three says this, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. So what he says here is he's like, I was really, really eager to write about salvation. And that's what I thought we'd talk about too, is that it'd be a great Sunday, celebrate our salvation. But if Jude says, hey, I felt compelled to write about something else, I should respect what Jude has to say and see what Jude was compelled about. Now, when you're eager to do something, you go at it. You're wholehearted, you're engaged, you're looking forward to it. When you're compelled to do something, it's generally a different story. Is that you feel like, well, I, I, I have to show up or I have to do this or um, someone's expecting this or you're compelled by the Holy Spirit where there's that prompting of like, go. And we have the choice to reject the Holy Spirit or to respond to the Holy Spirit. Now, there's many Sundays that I'm eager to give a message that I'm like, oh, this content is good. The scripture is amazing. You know, this is, this is going to be good. And then there's other ones where I'm compelled, like Jude, of like, I really don't want to speak this. I really don't want to share this because I don't know how it's going to land. Um, there's certain, you know, responses and so on and so forth. But Jude is saying it's important. It's so, so, so important that he's compelled to do this. And he was, e he was not eager to do this, but he was compelled. He felt the weightiness. And here's why. In verse four, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. All right, so what he's saying is he's saying there's wolves in sheep's clothing in your church. He's writing this to a church. And he's saying there's people in your church like this. What they do is they're ungodly and they pervert the grace of God and then they use it as a license for immorality and deny Jesus by what they're doing, by what they're saying. And so he's saying there's these wolves in sheep's clothing. But when we talk about wolves in sheep's clothing, we generally assume that the wolf knows it's a wolf, right? It's putting on this front to, to be in there. But what Jude is saying is that there's people who call themselves followers of Jesus, who say they know Jesus, they, they're saved, they, they, walk, they try to walk in this. But what they do is that they're perverting the grace and living how they so choose. He's saying they're ungodly. And they're taking this grace, which has been given as a gift, and they're taking it for granted, and they're just, in a sense, stomping on it. And he's saying they're present in the church. And the scary thing is, is that they may not know that they're wolves. They may not know that they're ungodly in godly's eyes. They may not know that they're perverting the grace. They may not know that they're taking this as a license for immorality. He's saying you have to pay attention to this. So in a sense, he's saying this. He's like, I'm saved. These people are say they're saved, but they're going to live and believe how they want to. They're going to go where they want to, say what they want to, look at whatever they want to, sleep with whoever they want to, be racist or sexist if they want to, spend their money however they want. They're going to drink and ingest whatever they want. They're going to do whatever they want, but I'm saved. You know what? God loves me. He'll forgive me. And he takes this grace that has been given as a license to sin. And Jude, he points it out as rebellion. He said, these people in the church are rebelling against God. And they need to know that. We need to know that. We need to be aware because I don't want to be that person. And I'm pretty confident that nor do you want to be that person. You don't want to be the one perverting the grace of God, of using license for immorality. Is that I assume the reason that you're here or you're watching online is that there's this desire to grow. And so how do we walk in this? How do we avoid being these people? Well, we're going to get to that at the end of the message. But what Jude is going to do is he's going to, he's going to frame this in a little bit more. And he's going to ask some questions and for us to consider as we consider his thoughts here. Because Jude is contending for faith in an everything is permissible kind of world. I mean, that's our world right now is that everything is permissible. But it's not necessarily beneficial. So he is just getting warmed up here in verse five. He's gonna say some things from scripture and from some other texts around that the readers are gonna know. 
they're going to click right on that. I'm going I'm to very briefly highlight and explain what he's getting at. And you can dig in deeper if you choose. Verse 5. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. So what he's saying here is, is the Israelites, they're coming out of Egypt together. But within that group, there's people who did not believe. And so what he's saying is, church, you have people in the church, but there's people in the church that may not believe, that are walking in this way. He gives another example. He says, in the angels, verse 6, who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. Again, the angels, they had a role, they had a responsibility, but there's some who said, nope, I'm out. They were in the group, but they abandoned the group. And then in verse 7, he says, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, I'm not going to go into the details because there's kids in the room and there's kids at home with you. But if you want to dig into a little bit more of what this is, is in Genesis 19, it unfolds what's happening, what Jude is pointing to in this verse. And he's saying it's, it's, there's, like it says there, it says there's sexual immorality. And so Jude is saying, you need to consider your view on this. Is your view a godly view rooted in scripture? Or is it something that's rooted in culture? Is your ethic, is your viewpoint a product of scripture or culture? Because what he's saying here in these, these, these passages and these examples is that like there's a movement of like the group, but then there's some saying, nope, I don't really walk in that or believe in that, so I'm, I'm out. Verses 8 through 10 says this, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pres- pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Okay, you probably just said, what? What was all of that about Moses' body and irrational animals and, and dreams and angels? What in the world? Well, what he's referencing is from the book of Enoch, which is in the Apocrypha. It's outside of scripture, the scripture that you're most likely holding. It's from a book of Enoch, and it's, it's explaining essentially that individuals can go after pleasure, can go over, over their independence, that they are sustainable within themselves, that they're under their own authority. But what Jude is saying is that that's not the way to live. It's we need to be under the authority and the lordship of God. He continues on, and he says, woe to them. How many of you use the word woe in a sentence this week? Probably not a whole lot of us. Because what that is, is that's a a pronouncement of judgment from God. You know, Nick's not walking through the church, and I'm like, whoa, Nick, you didn't do da-da-da. I'm not pronouncing God's judgment on Nick. And you usually don't do that anyway. But what he's getting at here is in verse 11, he says, woe to them. And what he's going to do is he's going to cram three Old Testament stories in one sentence. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. You got all that, right? You understand what he's getting at in all of those. As I read that, I'm going like, okay, Cain, the way of Cain, Cain murdered his brother and it was out of pride. It was out of impulsiveness. And what Cain was doing was he was saying, I, I am going to do what I want to do. I'm going to gain what I want to gain. And Balaam, uh, another complicated story, but essentially Balaam, when the Israelites get into the promised land, Balaam tempts them, gives them an opportunity to sin. And he's like, I'm going to do this. You want to do this too? And so he's saying, I'm going to do this. Come with me and do this. And then Korah's rebellion, Korah gathered people to stand against Moses. And I picture this mob mentality. I mean, Korah was working on the cancel culture reality before cancel culture became a term. He's like, Moses, I don't like what he's doing, so I'm going to get a group of people to cast shame and blame on him, and we're just going to try to get rid of him. 
And all three of these examples are examples, uh, examples of rebellion, of placing personal desires above the desires of God. So first he talks about those within a group identifying with a group, but really having thoughts and beliefs in a different way than an authority. And then he's talking about how pleasure is over any sort of revealed word. And then he's talking about rebellion against God creating chaos. He's saying these are ungodly people perverting grace. And they're amongst us. They call themselves followers of Jesus, but they're living in a different way. They want the grace of God, but as it says, they're, they're trampling on the grace of God. And anytime I take scripture and I try to change it to fit my situation, anytime I try to, to mold what God has revealed to accomplish what I want, anytime I justify what I'm doing to override the word of scripture, anytime I discredit scripture as ancient or archaic or um, just not relevant, this is what Jude's getting at is that, well, it really doesn't mean what it means in my situation. And Judah's saying, no, it, it stands. And in verse 12, when I walk in these ways that Jude is describing, this is how Jude describes me. Verse 12, as blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by wind, autumn trees, without fruit and uprooted twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars, for whom the black, blackest darkness has been reserved forever. So that's how Jude describes me. When I'm, when I'm fitting the word to mold and, and to make it like I want it to be, when I'm just ignoring it. And then this is how God will respond, Jude says. Verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them and all the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God's coming to judge. He's the ultimate judge. And when I walk in this, Jude describes my attitude this way in verse 16. These people are grumblers and fault finders. This is completely irrelevant to our time in our world right now, right? Well, have any grumblers or fault finders? They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others to their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers. Scoffers. I just, I pause on that. As, as I, I mentioned in the last service is that that I've got a side message going about scoffers and uh, a cynical spirit because I've witnessed it in people and I've witnessed it in myself. It's how easy it is to default. Like we started off talking about Thanksgiving, about gratitude, but how quickly we can default into being a scoffer or being cynical. And that's a dangerous place when we get in this place of cynicism. It's a dangerous place when we stop being thankful for what God has had, when we start looking at ourselves, and this is what, again, what Jude is warning us of. He says, there'll be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. So I look at verse 19. This goes back to the question that I posed earlier, is that in my attitudes, my beliefs, my actions... Am I, am I more like the one who follows natural instincts, just what I want, what I desire? Or am I one that's responding to the spirit of God as revealed by the holy word of God? I mean, this is really which way we go. You're either leaning towards this natural instinct or the spirit of God. And there's a tension in this. And there should be a tension, right? It's this flesh against spirit battle that we walk in every single day. It's the reality when we encounter temptation. What do we do with temptation? Do we just lean into the natural instincts or do we follow the spirit of God? 
Because there's many things in scripture where I'm like, I wish it didn't say that because life would be a whole lot easier. Or when someone comes to me for counsel, it'd be a whole lot easier just to say whatever they want to hear instead of getting that look back of like, oh, whew, I don't know if I agree with that. I was thinking about Jude and thinking of a conversation that I had with a, a good friend of mine who's not a believer. We were talking about Christianity, talking about faith, talking about the word of God. And we got to a particular topic in our conversation. And he looked me in the eye and he just said, if that's what the Bible says, I want nothing to do with it. If that's what Christians believe, I want nothing to do with it. I was like, okay. And that's a hard reality because these natural instincts in the spirit, they collide and they repel each other. It's this grace that we walk in and can embrace or trample on. Tim Keller said this. He said, to stay away from Christianity because part of the Bible is offensive assumes if there is a God, he wouldn't have any views that upset you. Let me say that one more time. To stay away from Christianity because part of the Bible is offensive assumes if there is a God, he wouldn't have any views that upset you. See, the tension in this quote here and what Tim Keller said is that it's either there is the God or I play God and my views are the views that God should have. Again, the tension between natural instincts and spirit. So is my belief, attitude, choices, actions a product of culture, the natural instincts? Or is it a product of scripture led by the spirit? So I said earlier is that, you know, I don't want to be, I don't don't want to be those that Jude is warning against. And Jude gives us a solution, an answer to how do we avoid walking in this? How is our heart molded? How do we avoid this trap? So it gives us six things. The first thing is this, is build yourself up. It's the first thing we're to do. This is in verse 20. Build yourself up. And what this does not mean, it does not mean stand in front of a mirror and be like, you are good looking. Or sitting there and just saying, you are smart. You are wonderful. That's, that's not what I'm getting at. But rather, allow the word of God to build you up. For you to look into it and to know that you are beloved, that you are forgiven, that you are cared for, that you are bought at a price, that that the list goes on and on and on of who you are, allowing the word to wash over you, to understand that God has a plan for you, that God knows your future, that God cares for you. It's, It's this molding of my heart and my mind to be like that of God's. And how we build ourselves up is is through the word. As scripture says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, but rather do what it says. Live out the word. So the second thing, after build yourself up, also found in verse 20, is pray in the Holy Spirit. What this does not mean is, dear God, thanks for this day. Um, Help me in this. Do this for me. I need this. Amen. That is not praying in the spirit. Praying in the Spirit is more like this. Heavenly Father, Lord, may your will be accomplished. Lord, I desire to listen to you. And so, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. And God, I want to pause before you. And it gets uncomfortable when we just sit because we feel like we have to produce. But praying in the Spirit is expecting the Spirit to speak to us. Because at that moment where I just stopped and I started talking again, is many times where I'm tempted to start talking again. Oh, yeah, 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 God, I forgot to ask you for this. But rather, it's this expectancy of of Spirit, you're going to speak to me. You're going to lay something on my heart. You're going to lay something on my mind. You're going to bring something to me to encourage me, to challenge me, to change me. But I need to just expect and pray in the Spirit to sit still and to be quiet. It's to wait 
on the Lord. Is lean into him. Third thing is keep yourself in God's love. So we go to the scripture to build ourselves up. We pray in the spirit with an expectant reality and then we keep ourselves in God's love. Is believe what the word of God says about you. Believe that you are loved. Believe that you are cared for. What you're praying in the spirit for, be reminded of what God spoke to you, what God encouraged you in the word and in prayer. And be patient. See, when we keep ourselves in God's love, when discouragement, when defeat, when challenge, when a roadblock, when brokenness come, we believe and we know that God loves us because we're meeting with him here. So Jude's saying really the first three are for you to, to really focus on yourself. But then the last three are for others. Fourth thing is to give mercy or compassion to those who doubt. Found in verse 22. Give mercy or compassion to those who doubt. I mean, it's so easy for someone who's like my friend that I mentioned, for me just to jump on and be like, I can't believe you don't believe this. And then I just throw lots of information at him. What is that going to accomplish? It's information that he's taken in. So it's giving mercy and this compassion to those who doubt. I was thinking about information and that we live in this information age and this knowledge overload. So some studies and some estimations have, have come out that until the year 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. So we had human knowledge, 100 years goes by, it doubles. Every 100 years, it doubles. That's until 1945. Then it doubled every 25 years. So the pace is picking up from every 100 years to 25 years. And then in 1982, some changes are happening. Every 12 to 13 months, human information knowledge is doubling in 1982. And in 2020, it's estimated that the amount of human information and knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. Every 12 hours. There's no wonder it's a struggle trying to figure out what is true, what's being said, what, what motives people have. And so by throwing information at people instead of mercy and compassion, it's just more information overload at them. And the church went through decades where it was just like, just, just as if you can convince them with all these facts, all these truths, read all these books, everyone's going to get saved. But it's information. So how do we give mercy and compassion to those who doubt? Jude calls us for this patient, consistent, faithful building. My friend, I didn't bail on him. There's still that relationship that goes on, that consistent building and care. It's about a heart change, not a head change. The fifth thing Jude talks about is snatching, save others by snatching them from the fire. So this is going to be the message, but I'm going to give it to you in like 30 to 60 seconds here, right? This is the original message. Ultimately, it's God who saves, but he desires to use humans to be a part of it. Salvation is a great mystery, but we're allowed to be a part of it. I want you to think of your salvation story, how you came to know Jesus. And if you were to stand up in this place and, and to tell me how you came to know Jesus, I would say there's one rule. You are not allowed to include any other human beings in your story. Just about every single person would say, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. Because I would talk about my mom who sat with me and shared the gospel with me and that I responded to. I would talk about my grandma who prayed for me. I would talk about Sunday school teachers who planted the truth at little, little moments along the way. And I think you'd say the same thing, that there's other people. And so we have the opportunity to save others by snatching them from the fire. It's by sharing the gospel. It's by speaking the truth with words, not just your lifestyle, with words too. The sixth and final thing is show others mercy mixed with fear. So it ties into this one. We're to give mercy and compassion, just like here, but it says mixed with fear. Now that doesn't mean scare them, but it means help them understand who God is, this respect, this reverence. Help them understand that really the next hour is not even guaranteed. Like we've all experienced how quickly life can be taken from us, how quickly things can change. And so there is an urgency. There's still this mercy, this compassion with those who doubt, showing this mercy, 
but mixing it with fear. Again, not scaring them, but speaking of the urgency and the respect and the reverence and what God demands of us. See, we contend for the faith, as Jude said, not by not having the goal of being right. It's not just about being right. I think that's an error that too many Christians have made. We don't have to be right. We have to just share Jesus. And the Spirit of God does an amazing work. Salvation is a mysterious reality. It's a beautiful reality. But we're to contend for this faith by not being right, but rather pointing to this new birth of this living hope. And in 1 Peter, it says it this way. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. He's given us new birth into a living hope. It's the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death, the resurrection of Jesus that gives us something that's not going to perish, spoil, or fade because everything else will. And so we walk in this living hope. And what an appropriate verse for this time of year is new birth. I mean, the beginning of Advent, as it's already been mentioned, is we think of hope. And hope is not grown-up wishing. Like as kids, you wish for things, right? As an adult, well, I just hope because it's more mature kind of wishing. No, 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 no. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. Hope is confident expectation that what Jesus said will be. What Jesus said is that the promises of God are yes and amen. And it's a living hope that we have. We're reminded in this season with the birth of Jesus. And as I drove by the fountain this morning and I looked in the center of our town, I love that our town still does this. There's Jesus. There's Jesus. What an opportunity we have in this season to speak of this living hope in the light of a pandemic, in the light of the reality of the world that we live in, that you have a hope that goes far beyond temporal realities, things that will perish and spoil and fade, a hope, a living hope in Jesus, about the expectation that Jesus came as a child, but that Jesus will return. And so we've lit this candle as a symbol of that hope. So this Advent season, as we walk through this time, I ask that you be intentional, personally and to those around you, that you would walk being reminded of the living hope, that you would contend for the faith because of the living hope of Jesus. What a great season to speak this truth in love to those around us and for ourselves to be reminded of that same thing. This is how Jude ended his letter in verses 24 and 25. He said, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now, now, and forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus. And Lord, this season can be a season where we go through the motions, or it can be a season of renewal, of a reminder of the new birth, this living hope that we have in Jesus. And Father, I pray for each person who knows you as their Lord and Savior, that we would walk in this hope and then the strength, Lord, that we would contend for the faith personally, Lord, in those areas of darkness, those areas of um, whatever it is that we may be hiding or, or walking through, God, that we would reveal that to you. Lord, you know it already. We would confess it. And Lord, we would lean into you and trust you. For each person that has not yet received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God, I pray for salvation for them. And even today, if you're watching, if you're here, that if you've not been forgiven of your sins, if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the starting point. It's the starting point of a lifelong journey walking with Jesus. But it's a yes. 
And so if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, if you're ready for this newness, to walk in this living hope, focus on things of eternal, you can pray with me. As dear Jesus, so I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. And I've tried with my own strength. I've tried to do things my own way. But here today, I confess my sin to you. Jesus, please forgive me, and I receive your forgiveness of all of my sin. Lord, I trust that you've taken that sin on the cross, and you've made me a new creation starting today. And so, Father, today I proclaim you as my Savior, and today I commit to walking with you as my Lord. I commit to know you more, to learn your ways, to contend for the faith, as Jude said. So Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen us, you'd direct us, you'd guide us. Heavenly Father, that we would be a church speaking hope and living hope each and every day. So Lord, you're good. We're so thankful for you. We pray this all in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. (laughs) 